You'll remember that this course was born out of a recognition that we need to nourish the whole student, body, spirit, and mind. But what about actual nourishment? My name is Rodolfo Mendoza Denton. I'm a psychology professor here at UC Berkeley, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dri Cavusi, fourth year undergraduate and ASUC senator. To talk about the topic of nutrition and nourishment, we have two distinguished guests, Toby Morris, clinical dietitian in University Health Services, and Renee Simpson, registered dietitian and nutritionist in Cal Dining. Thank you for joining us and welcome. Renee, you and I were exchanging emails earlier and I noticed that your signature was from the food critic character in the movie Ratatouille. Tell us about that a little bit. Uh, the quote is, I don't like food, I love it. If I don't love it, I don't swallow. And when I heard that in the movie, it made me think of my own personal uh, philosophy of how I eat. I eat what I love. Uh, I don't think that you should eat food just because it's healthy. It needs to be delicious as well. So that keeps you from overdoing it. And Toby, how did you get involved in nutrition? Uh, I've been involved in nutrition for a long time. Um, I've been a dietitian for, I guess, about 12 years now. and. I just love working with people. I love, you know, teaching and, and talking and um, counseling people working one on one and also in group settings. And so I became a dietitian because I realized I really wanted some in depth knowledge about a certain topic. I kind of came out of my undergraduate program with a breadth of knowledge and then decided I wanted to go a lot deeper into a topic that I was really interested in. And I've always been interested in, in food and, and health. So speaking of undergraduates, and Renee, you hit on this, a lot of new students, first time out of the house, they're eating on their own. How do they eat healthy and well and tasty food without you know, going over the limit of eating too much junk or too, too healthy? Uh, well, the thing is to, they have to get used to the fact that all this food is available to them. Uh, one of the things that we do at Cal Dining, I'll provide the students with some guidance through the dining hall. So I will do a class, kind of a class, where I walk them through and show them the different options that we have, let them know, yes, there's pizza every day, but there's also the organic salad bar options every day. Uh, if you want to have, like I said, if, if you don't love it, don't swallow. So if you want to have some pizza, have it every now and then if it's your absolute favorite. Don't just eat it just because it's there, because I think that is what happens a lot of times. They just eat the things just because it's there. So they have to get used to it being there. Renee, can I just ask you, you mentioned I offer a class. Can you tell us a little bit more about this class, keeping in mind that many of our viewers may never have heard of it? Where do they go? What's the class called? Okay, so what I'll do is I'll adjust the class or design it for the students' needs. Mm -hmm. Usually the students will contact me and say they're interested in bringing some other students over and just learning what we have to offer. So I'll find out what exactly do they need. A couple of times they've wanted to know something about um, how to navigate through the dining halls without overeating. So, you know, that will be the topic. I've had students to come over to learn how to make their own pizza dough. It just depends on what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And where do they go? Is there a specific address, a specific building, or a phone number? Usually they'll just contact me directly mm -hmm. at rmsimpson at berkeley.edu. Mm -hmm. And then they'll, we'll email back and forth, and I'll have them come over and meet with me, and then we'll meet at the dining hall and take a tour, and then just adjust the class to meet their needs. Through Cal Dining services. Through Cal Dining. So I remember in my own entry into college, just the, the terrible joke, the freshman 15. What is that? Does it still exist? Does it go away? How do you prevent it? I can address that if go ahead. it's okay. Um, so I think that this concept of the freshman 15 is a bit of a myth, mm -hmm. actually. Um, I think that most of the research that I've read actually suggests that students might gain two, three pounds during their first year of college. So I think the idea that everybody is putting on 15 pounds is really just not true. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when you're a teenager, a young adult, some growth and development is actually normal. It's mm -hmm. part of becoming an adult. And so I think a little bit of weight gain for some people is perfectly normal and healthy. Um, and 
so I think, unfortunately, this myth kind of feeds into an underlying anxiety and a fixation about um, food and weight and body image mm -hmm. in, in what I feel like is a negative way. And what resources are available for students that, you know, they're fresh out of the house, want to know the nutritional value. They might be eating in the dining commons. They might have their own apartment. They might be living in uh, parent housing. How do they make food for themselves or learn about nutrition? Well, um, I think it's amazing that we have Renee available to students who are, you know, involved in the um, in the dining commons so that they can get some one-on-one -on -one help and um, other resources available through um, the dining services. And as far as um, on campus, at University Health Services, the Tang Center, I'm there, so I provide one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling for 20 to 30 students a week. Mm -hmm. um, I try to offer as much as I can in ways that will reach more students at once. Um, so, for example, this video series is an amazing opportunity to reach a lot of students at once. We try to offer information on our website at the Tang Center. Um, and we, you know, I occasionally will offer groups so I can reach more students uh, in, at one time. And so if students have individual concerns, they're welcome to come make an appointment. Any student has access to me. Graduate, undergraduate students can all see me um, for a one-on-one -on -one nutrition session or several sessions, depending on what their needs are. And to switch gears to actually eating right, does the time of day matter when you eat? You know, a lot of students, they wake up, they don't have time for breakfast. You know, they maybe have a cup of coffee and they run to class. Mm -hmm. should mm -hmm. the, what, what should we be eating? When should we be eating? That's a really good question. And what I see a lot in the one-on-one -on -one sessions that I do with students is that, you know, students are struggling w with s sometimes going very long periods without eating. Mm -hmm. So, for example, they'll skip breakfast. They may skimp on lunch or skip lunch, not e begin eating until afternoon time. And what happens then is that their tendency is to want to overeat later in the evening. Um, sleep schedules can get discombobulated during college too, right? Staying up really late at night. And so what I find is that sometimes the later at night it, it gets, um, the worse the nutrition choices become. So students tend to want to snack on lower nutritional quality foods late at night. So they're studying and munching on chips or they're eating you know, fast food or fried food in the middle of the night. And that's not necessarily a healthy choice for them, nor is it gonna help support you know, their studies that they're doing. So it's not necessarily the time of day, it's that if you go very long periods without eating, you're going to be more prone to choosing unhealthy foods. Well, and presumably, uh, I mean, not presumably, in fact, nighttime is a period of fasting. Uh, so waking up represents a period during which you haven't, uh, you haven't eaten for a long period of time. Does that make breakfast an especially important part of, uh, of your nutrition cycle? Breakfast definitely is important, but it, it also depends on the personal schedule of that individual. We say breakfast, so we're thinking what, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., but if someone's schedule has them waking up at 8 and getting going at 10, then they're going to end their day quite a bit later as well. So it just depends on your personal schedule. But one thing I wanted to add was that uh, for students on the go, we're starting, we've started adding um, a healthy smoothie. So we already had the regular smoothies, you know, about with, you know, some, uh, maybe they have some uh, sugary items in them. But we actually have some very healthy smoothies that have no sugar added, fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, they're non-dairy. So those, we're starting to see those gain in popularity with the students mm -hmm. uh, who are on the go, and those are served all day long. That led to my next question. How, how does a student who has minimal time eat healthy? That is one of the ways. And then also we have uh, the Choose to Reuse program at all of our dining uh, commons, all four dining commons, where they, it used to be a disposable box you could get, a to-go box, but now it's uh, a box that you can purchase. And it's, um, not sure the price right now, it might be $5 now. But you purchase it at the front door when you walk into the dining commons. And whatever food you choose to put in that, you take that with you and you can eat that on the go. The next visit, you return that box and you get a clean one. And what about students who uh, are not, uh, do, don't have access for any number of reasons to Cal Dining? Um, what are some healthy options for students on the go? 
Well, I, I talk with students a lot about this topic of, you know, how do you squeeze healthy eating into a busy lifestyle, which is an issue for throughout life, right? It's an issue for me, even though I'm no longer a student, but I'm busy, I've got two young children at home who need to eat, and so it's juggling all of that can get tricky. Um, I think this is a really important time of life to begin to develop those habits that are gonna take you through the rest of your life in a healthy way. So it's like learning how to do these healthy behaviors on your own without the support of your family, your parents kind of doing it for you. So it's, it's establishing those habits. And I think that making the time to actually eat something healthy, whether it's three meals a day or ideally with maybe a, a snack or two in between there, because oftentimes students have a very long gap between meals, like for example, lunch in the middle of the day and then maybe not dinner until you know, seven, eight, nine o'clock at night. And so they definitely need to be having some kind of fuel coming in in those afternoon hours. So I work a lot with students to help them figure out how to put together a healthy balanced meal and sometimes pack it and bring it with them to eat or find locating the places on campus where they can grab something balanced. And it doesn't need to be elaborate and home cooked and complicated. It really could be something quick and easy um, on the go. But they, I think it's making it a priority to actually stop eat something, take at least a few minutes to, to just consume those healthy mm -hmm. calories. It's just a really crucial part of um, being a healthy person. Um, also, um, just wanted to add that Cal Dining is for anyone who wants to come in and pay for a meal. It's not just for the students. It is open to the public. And then we also have uh, retail locations where you can go in and purchase uh, snacks to go. So it, it's you know part of the part of the raison d'être of this show is to expose students to precisely that kind of information that you just mentioned. Retail outlets. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Uh, so if you have a meal plan or if you don't have a meal plan, they take credit cards, they take cash, mm -hmm. and you can come in and make purchase of pretty much anything. There's snacks, there's toiletries. Right. What uh, are the retail locations meals. That, that you refer to? Uh, there's uh, Golden Bear, uh, there's uh, Bear Market. There are several of them all over campus. And you can find those on a website. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, caldining.berkeley.edu. Uh, caldining.berkeley.edu. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I know my freshman year, I would buy loaves of bread and peanut butter from mm -hmm. those stores mm -hmm. with my meal mm -hmm. points, just because, yeah. you know, just to pack my lunch for the next day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Additionally, and I know Cal Dining has their hand in this, and maybe you can elaborate, eating locally, eating sustainably, eating healthily and affordably. Mm -hmm. What resources are there for students around the campus to do, to eat this way, to do this? Berkeley is an amazing place for food. So students who are interested in food and have passion about food have come to the right place. Um, I think I've worked a bit with the um, Student Food Collective, which is an amazing group of people and run by a lot of student volunteers who are passionate about food. Um, they have a storefront right on Bancroft, just up from the Tang Center, and um, they sell locally grown produce there in the store, as well as some packaged items, so like um, cooked packaged foods that you could grab for lunch, um, beverages, but also kind of um, staple items as well. And it's all great organic stuff. Um, the produce, I believe, is all grown within maybe 250 miles of campus, um, so it's a really great chance to kind of support a campus organization, but also try out some local produce. I just wanted to say when you said the 250 miles, just the other night we had a dinner at all of our dining commons where all of the food that we served was local. Wow. So it came from within 250 miles of pretty simple meals, but they were very, very good and they were very popular with the students. Yeah. Do, does, uh, does Cal Dining have theme nights or programs yes. uh, that are centered around particular topics? That was actually for Earth Day. Uh -huh. And we did a similar menu for Food Day, which is in October. Uh, we have Cinco de Mayo coming up. Pretty much every month there's a themed dinner. So we've talked about um, the options in, in Cal Dining, uh, options for healthy eating outside of Cal Dining and in the, uh, in the retail spaces uh, that are managed by Cal Dining. Um, we've also talked about uh, being on the go and the importance of planning ahead for meals. I think it's really important to uh, remember that there are individuals on this campus who can help students think through their dietary choices so that it's not a sea of food out there and they have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about uh, 
eating and fitness. Yes, you mentioned that a lot of students aren't necessarily getting the proper nutrition when they first come to Cal. And I know as a, as a young person, as a young woman, young men, anyone in between, there's a lot of pressure in our society to be fit and thin. What would you say to someone who is recovering from an eating disorder or might have eating disorder habits themselves? Mm -hmm. What advice would you give them as a nutritionist? Well, first I would say that if, if someone is coming into Berkeley um, as a new student and has been suffering from or dealing with or in recovery from disordered eating, that you know, this is a, coming to college is a really big transition. So it can be an exciting but also stressful time, an important time to get some extra support. So whether they have perhaps a treatment team at home that they are staying in contact with or whether they want to establish care here locally, which I recommend, I think, you know, depending on where someone is in their recovery process can be really important to have support nearby that you have regular contact with. So usually we recommend, you know, multidisciplinary care, which involves perhaps meeting with a therapist on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, having a dietitian that you can talk to on a regular basis or as needed. Um, having medical care, so medical checkups every so often, depending on, again, your health status and where you are in your recovery process. So we sometimes have students coming in who right away establish their team once they come. And we do have eating disorder specialists at the Tang Center. So I'm a member of our eating disorder treatment team. We also have a, a medical doctor who specializes in eating disorders. We have therapists who specialize. We also collaborate with therapists in the local area who have expertise in eating disorders so that we can really get students into the right you know, care setting. And if they do end up needing higher level of care, we can refer them to other programs in the community. How does one identify or raise a flag when there is an eating disorder? In other words, how do you distinguish uh, healthy eating, the occasional overeating from uh, some kind of eating disorder or under eating, I should say? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a hard question to answer. Um, it's really eating, I believe, is on a continuum. Mm -hmm. And um, so oftentimes people will engage in behaviors. In fact, the research tells us that the majority of college students have at some point engaged in disordered eating habits in an effort to change the shape of their body. So that is very common, but a behavior occasionally that isn't you know, necessarily a healthy behavior or uh, sort of an over fixation on weight or shape does not necessarily mean that that person has a clinical eating disorder. Um, so it can become more severe and once it kind of takes on a life of its own and the person's no longer in control of that behavior. And oftentimes there's pretty serious medical consequences too. Um, that, that becomes really a serious clinical disorder that requires um, multidisciplinary care. A lot of students that do come to college, you know, at first they might, the first semester, gain a few extra pounds just mm -hmm. eating unhealthily. And then, you know, next semester they say, okay, I'm going to try to eat healthy every day and exercise every day. Does that involve eating salads for every meal and having to go to the gym five hours a day? Or are there easier or different ways to do that? Yeah, it doesn't have to just be salads. I mean, mm -hmm. there's all kind of grilled vegetables, steamed vegetables. Um, I, I often recommend uh, 50 percent vegetables on your plate. Mm -hmm. If they can get past that bakery, that helps because we do have a bakery right there in in our largest dining hall mm -hmm. uh, and we have baked goods in all four. But um, if they can get past that and get over to the vegetables and then we have always have lean meat options available, lean protein. What about specifically for students who are uh, interested in fitness and exercise? Let's say that they are in a competitive sport or a club sport. Um, is, is the recommendation different there? Um, yes, so students who are doing more exercise have different nutrition needs than students who are more sedentary. So I think it's wonderful for students to be physically active. Um, the intercollegiate sports teams have a dietitian who works specifically with them. Her name is um, Suzanne. She's wonderful, really knowledgeable. And athletes at that level definitely need really specific nutrition. And mm -hmm. for the rest of us recreational exercisers, um, Yes, you, I think a nutritional balanced diet is, is extra important and um, they're welcome to see me for specific individual 
help with that. And and Renee, just to just to ask you specifically about mm -hmm. the uh, fifty percent of the food on your plate should be vegetables. Does that also hold for people who are trying to let's say bulk up on muscle uh, or cut down on their uh, body fat? Uh, definitely for cutting down on body fat, but it all it's pretty individual. It depends mm -hmm. on what they were eating like before. So. Mm -hmm. You know, in general, 50% is good, but it, it just depends on what their diet was prior to, to me meeting them. Do you see a lot of students, I know a big fad right now is taking supplements to bulk up really quickly, different, you know, diet pills. What do you all have to say about that? Um, I think supplements, I, I'm very wary about supplements, mm -hmm. uh, just mainly because they're not regulated by any oversight body. So it's sort of at your own risk if you decide that you want to take supplements. In general, food is an excellent source of nutrients and then the best source. And if you're eating the amount you're supposed to, you should be getting those nutrients anyway. Yeah. Yeah, and if they're trying to bulk up, they're going to have to do something physical to do that. I mean, we're, we're talking about long term. So if you're doing supplements short term, that's one thing. But if you want something lasting, you need to develop habits that can carry you for long term. So an important point to make, which is that if you want to if you want to develop muscle, you actually you need to move those develop muscles, the muscle. not only the <laughs> musculature around the mouth. Right. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, healthy healthy eating and healthy nutrition. Let's turn our focus for uh, for the remaining minutes on malnutrition. Yeah. So, what do y'all consider to be malnutrition? Well, any area that you're deficient in, if you're lacking in certain nutrients, that's malnutrition. There's also overnutrition. If you're obese, overweight, that's the opposite, overnutrition. But uh, mal meaning to be lacking in, in any nutrient. Mm -hmm. And what different resources are available for students who, you know, might run out of money for food or might have food insecurity? So um, it's this is happening on our campus, believe it or not. So. Um, Many students find that they, they just, their budgeting isn't quite right. They kind of run out of funds and food isn't, um, you know, access to food isn't always consistent. And so um, there's a new, fairly new student pantry on campus where students can go up to two times a month if needed. It's meant to serve as sort of an emergency food source while students continue to look for more sustainable sources of food. And what kind of items do, does the food pantry have? Lots of great stuff. Mm -hmm. It's um, many ready-to-eat items, cereals, bars, granola bars, that kind of thing, but also some ingredients that students can use to make simple meals like pasta sauce and pasta, for example. Yep. And you were saying to me before earlier about something about fresh foods, locally harvested foods. Mm -hmm. So our campus has a farm called the Gill Track Farm and the pantry folks have teamed up with the farm and they do a harvest day once a month mm -hmm. where the, um, they talk about issues around food at the harvest and then they also bring back the produce to the pantry where students can take a bunch of fresh produce home in addition to the non-perishables. And in addition, in Cal Dining, is, are there any scholarships or food programs that one could apply for? I am not familiar. Not to say there aren't, but I'm, I'm not familiar. But are you speaking of the Bear Pantry? Is that the same thing? So there's a pantry at the University Village uh, okay. that's for families. So students mm -hmm. who have children can get access to the Bear Pantry at, wow. the, at the University Village. But now there's a pantry for all UC Berkeley students here. It's right up on Bancroft at Stiles Hall and all students can access that. In fact, if they have kids, they can um, also attend that pantry and get even a little bit more to support their family members. And you said you could go there once a month. How, how often or you how can, does... You can go up to two times a month okay. if needed, so it's a really wonderful yeah, resource. Absolutely. How does one who might have these food insecurities, what would you say to them? How can you fight that stigma to being unable to buy food and how, how can we get food security on this campus for all the students? That's a really huge question. I wish I had the answer to that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's become a really important topic and there's a lot of, um, you know, campus-wide but also UC-wide mm -hmm. initiatives going on to address that very problem because yeah. I think it's a, it's a big one also just for our, our country as a whole. Like this is, a, this is an issue. So I, I don't have an, a good answer to that question. For the students that are living in the dorms though, however, the meal plan is automatically part of that. So they are covered with 
some yeah. sort of meal. I mean, the, the, the basic meal plan is going to give them, I believe, about 10 to 12 meals a week anyway, so. That's excellent. Let's talk a little bit about the experience of walking into a dining hall. Renee, you mentioned the, uh, the, the goal of if you can get past the, <laughs> uh, the bakery uh, and, and onto the salad, but what are some strategies that, um, as dietitians, you might be able to share with us about making those healthy choices right there and then when there's so much temptation and the potential for healthy as well as unhealthy eating. What can students do? So like I said, if I don't, if I don't love it, I don't swallow. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the, the bakery, the, the um, Honey Bear Bakery, mm -hmm. and you see all these items and they're there every day, there's gotta be something that's your favorite. It mm -hmm. can't all be your favorite. Pick your favorite and enjoy it when, when it's available. Pick and choose, pick your, as they say, pick your battles. Mm -hmm. uh, you could also choose a day. You know, Friday is the day that I'm going to enjoy the pizza or the bakery or the yogurt, the frozen yogurt or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Pick a day, but you, you have to make up your own strategy that'll keep you from just going in there without boundaries. Can you talk to us about late night? I know that's a really popular thing um, for incoming students. And can you tell us what late night is for students that might not know? We do have late night uh, meals available or service at the dining commons. Uh, it, it is a lot of fatty food though. <laughs> and that tends to be the request at that time of night for some reason. Uh, but we do have some healthy options available as well, and I'd like to push for more healthy options. And as you've been saying, everything in moderation. Mm -hmm. you, know, you pick one day a week maybe to right. go to late night with your friends. Right. Yeah. I think also, I just want to piggyback on um, something that Renee said, that, that plate model, um, this idea of filling up half your plate with fruits and vegetables, you know, I usually encourage pay, pay, uh, my clients to, you know, have some lean protein on their plate, have some some healthy, high fiber carbohydrate if possible, like some kind of starch. If you kind of use this model of this balanced meal with plenty of fruits and vegetables, that tends to fill people up and feel pretty satisfied, and it's a really nutritious way to eat. If you added a treat onto that, or what I like to call a fun food, you know, occasionally as a treat on top of that, I think it's still a great basis for a, a balanced way to eat. And what about that old food pyramid? Is that still something? It's, an, it's a plate now. So it's yeah, plate. it's not a pyramid, it's a it's plate. A plate. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and choosemyplate.gov is the, is the new USDA model. Okay. And what is, it, what is it at, the, at the drink spot of that plate? There's a, I think there's a little dairy, right? A serving of dairy mm -hmm. there, which um, I know this is, you know, getting into political issues, but um, I think the point is that in moderation, you know, low fat, non-fat dairy products, yogurt, milk, um, for some people is also part of a balanced diet. Many of my clients don't even consume dairy for whatever reason, maybe they're lactose intolerant. Mm -hmm. So that model isn't, isn't for everybody. And that brings up a, an excellent point. At, at Cal Dining, are there options for uh, vegans? Are there options for vegetarians? Are there options, Absolutely. are there other options there available? Plenty of options. Uh, we always have vegan or vegetarian options available. As far as the milk, we have soy, uh, and we're now starting to have almond milk available as well. Mm -hmm. um, I see a number of students with food allergies, uh, so we have gluten-free options available as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see a gluten-free pantry or station come up in the next few semesters. Hopefully mm -hmm. we'll get that mm -hmm. as well. So as you know, these segments are short. They're short on purpose to be uh, chock full of information. Um, and one of the things that we offer our guests is the opportunity to uh, provide that 15 second nugget of information that you would like each incoming undergraduate to the university to remember as they move forward in their journey at Berkeley. Let me ask you to think about that for a second. Renee, is there something you would want to say? Uh, this is a great time to develop lifelong eating habits. Uh, one of the things that I didn't uh, get to mention was that I also provide, our Cal Dining, we provide uh, cooking classes as a life skill for students. I've actually gone into the dorms with a hot plate and taught simple you know, cooking skills. Uh, so this is a time for them to explore different foods. Uh, we have lots of foods from different cultures and um, just develop good, healthy eating habits. The idea of habits, again, is one of these uh, themes that keeps coming up throughout our segments. Toby? 
I guess my one most important piece of information that I want to offer students is that um, while there's lots and lots of information out there about healthy eating and nutrition and food and nutrients, ultimately our bodies are equipped with really amazing um, internal information, wisdom about what it needs, right? We know when we're hungry, we can find out when we've had enough, we feel full. Um, we can pay attention to cravings and, and the desire, the taste of food, like really eating like a connoisseur, as Renee was saying. And I think that cultivating that awareness, a mindfulness, a mindful awareness of your body's cues is really crucial for students and will serve them in lots of great ways. So to help balance that out with all this factual nutrition information that they're, that they're also getting. Thank you so much. Toby Morris, Renee Simpson, thank you for being here and thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next segment.